Thank you, Dr. Martinez and Dr. Molina. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I am going to try and simplify everything that you've heard because it actually can become quite mind-boggling. So I'm going to have some summary slides, and you're going to see some issues that I bring up that are going to be recurrent. None of my disclosures are at, at all uh, relevant for today. I'm going to take you through endoscopically how to appropriately diagnose Barrett's. I'll take you through some screening strategies and really understand and how to implement a surveillance program. So really, for diagnosis, we have to identify the GE junction. We will talk a bit about biopsy technique. We'll talk about screening and risk factors. And we'll talk uh, about surveillance recommendations. So you've already heard some of the epidemiology. You've already heard some of the pathology issues. But we have to really make the case that reliable diagnosis is important. Can we prevent the cancer? And can we also then responsibly and effectively screen? So if we're not accurate in the biopsies and overcalling Barrett's on the low end, we're going to have too many patients that have Barrett's who may potentially, if they're indefinite or low grade, end up having ablative therapies that may not be needed. And on the other hand, on the high end, which is not, from my perspective, as big an issue, if we resect a lesion that's intramucosal carcinoma, it turns out to be invasive carcinoma on review, not such a big issue down the road. The GE junction is really difficult to identify endoscopically, as, as you saw, though there are some issues that we can look at. We can identify the squamal columnar junction, we can identify a hiatal hernia, and we can look for the perforating vessels, which in this picture you can see extending under the, the squamous epithelium and then down into what is arguably a hiatal hernia, and that is the area that we worry about having the Barrett's esophagus. We also do look for the top of the gastric folds, and again, uh, insufflated or desufflated stomach can affect that. Very clearly, we're looking for specialized intestinal uh, metaplasia one centimeter or above, uh, or more above the GE junction. Do not biopsy an irregular GE junction, and that's really a, a critical issue that I'll come back to. We want to use the Prey classification in order to identify the extent. We look at the circumferential extent of the total uh, Barrett's epithelium, and we also look at the maximal extent. We use high-resolution video. That slide, sorry, is, got messed up. We look at white light, high def, as the standard at this point in time, utilizing magnification. Enhanced imaging with NBI may be helpful to help identify uh, the Barrett's. We want a slow exam, one minute per centimeter. Uh, erosive changes, as you heard, are quite a problem for the pathologist. I would say it's our fault as endoscopists if we give them biopsies from inflamed areas, put the patient on a PPI, and bring them back eight to 12 weeks down the road, and then biopsy them. These are pictures showing really the enhancement that you can have with NBI and high def in order to be able to identify the junction. Retroflex views are also uh, helpful and required. You'll see here uh, that at, in a real-time image, you'd start to see a little nodule right at the squamal columnar junction, and that's on the palisading vessels, and that turns out to be a small intramucosal carcinoma there. So take your time. This picture is meant to scare you, uh, and hopefully it will make everybody slow down and take time. Biopsies 4Q, 2 centimeters if there's no dysplasia or if it's the initial endoscopy. Four biopsies every centimeter if there's any documented dysplasia. And EMR, EMR, EMR. I normally give talks on therapy, so I had to at least bring that up today. Uh, any lesion or any mucosal abnormality should be resected using uh, EMR. And then biopsies should be taken with what's referred to as a turn and suck technique. You really plant yourself into the lumen, into the wall, to maximize your biopsy. Mucosal resections, again, for any of those mucosal abnormalities, you may cure Barrett's if there's a tongue that you need to resect. Any nodular area should have an EMR uh, performed on that to accurately stage that area. Uh, they are not appropriate for RFA at all if you end up with a patient with nodules and high-grade or intramucosal carcinoma. That area has to be resected. Do not EMR inflammation unless you feel like having to put an obesco clip on and close an opening after you make one. That can be dangerous, but it can also be difficult at times to determine when you have a mucosal break such as what we have on the left 
uh, versus something that's inflammation, but you should go ahead and resect that area. I now know why my slides are uh, off. This is actually not the most recent slide deck that I put in. Um, we'll go through a little bit of the uh, low-grade progression. It's absolutely critical that we have the low-grade accurately identified, but there's a problem that, that the pathologists have. The problem that pathologists have is they can agree on histology, what is low grade, but they don't know the biologic behavior of those lesions. Recommendations for diagnosis, bears should be diagnosed when there is more than one centimeter salmon colored mucosa proximal to the G junction. We feel that it does absolutely require pathologic confirmation. You should use a product classification and also document, as you heard earlier, the G junction and the squamocolumnar junction. Minimum of eight biopsies should be taken for, uh, for absolutely short segments, four, four biopsies per centimeter. For tongues, at least one biopsy per centimeter. At this point, the recommendations have changed. Uh, if you feel that you have potentially Barrett's but missed it, then you can repeat in one to two years. But if you have a biopsy that does show Barrett's without dysplasia, there is no need to repeat until years three to five. Screening, I'll go through quickly. Uh, carcinoma risk is, is clear. Uh, obviously, Barrett's is underdiagnosed. We already, I think, have established that well. Um, and then the treatment modalities for endoscopic intramucosal carcinoma and for high-grade dysplasia are much more appealing than the options. Unfortunately, only 1.5% uh, of the population is found to have Barrett's um, up front, but in esophageal adenocarcinoma, 8% of them were found at prior Barrett's, only 11% at prior EGD, and in retrospect, about 22% did have reflux symptoms. So screening should be reliable with high sensitivity and specificity, should be effective at identifying not only uh, those that have Barrett's, but also those with early carcinoma, simple, expensive, and widely applicable. The guidelines from the three GI societies vary widely, but they have some commonality. Age, gender, obesity, uh, and also family history are really the critical components. Screening, again, going back to high def white light, it's absolutely critical, uh, and we can talk a little bit about the adjuncts. This is a paper from Rubenstein out of the University of Michigan looking at Barrett's prediction tool. Again, he looked at GERD, age, weight uh, with wa waist to hip ratio and pack years of tobacco. Similarly, Thrift looked at a uh, complex model adding on to each different phase of the model. And when we look at those and compare them, looking at the line on the right uh, and looking at the areas under the curve, each of the models as it becomes more complex becomes more accurate, but at the same time less and less applicable and much harder to implement. When we look at transnasal endoscopy, uh, it's somewhat problematic. It's something that everyone talks about, but patients, once they've had it, don't necessarily like to come back for it. Uh, so willing to repeat is really a key issue. If you're sedated for endoscopy, you're more likely to come back in the U.S. than if you're not sedated for transnasal. Cytosponge screening has been looked at. The key issue here is, again, sensitivity specificity are a bit lower than we would like to have. And the bottom right, uh, you can see endoscopy versus cytosponge. Again, cytosponge, the propensity or the likelihood of somebody repeating it is less than a sedated endoscopy. Screening recommendations for men, basically with chronic or frequent GERD, along with risk factors, age, Caucasian, central obesity, tobacco, current or past, and a first degree relative either with Barrett's or esophageal adenocarcinoma. Women, the indications are a bit softer, but should be for those with multiple risk factors, and general population screening is not recommended at this point in time. Screening should only occur in the setting of uh, a complete evaluation of the patient's life expectancy and the implications, uh, and then moving on, they should again not be biopsied if there's esophagitis. I'll quickly go through surveillance uh, and take a little bit through patient anxiety as reasons for it. We have to look at the issues of compliance, physician compliance and patient compliance. Physicians do start to become lazy with longer segments of Barrett's esophagus and longer duration of screening. Patients also become complacent about returning for endoscopies when they haven't had any bad news. 
The bottom slide here from Greenwald really brings up the issue of pathology. You can have low grade, but you can have low grade that's nearly no grade, or you can have low grade that's nearly high grade as far as its actual pathologic behavior, and that's a huge, huge problem because that low grade that we get back doesn't necessarily tell us. Cernostics has a way of looking at path data integration. That will be one thing to look at down the future, but right now, for large population screening, not necessarily the way to go. It gives you a propensity score. So for surveillance recommendations, surveillance only after counseling of risks benefits, high resolution white light, and again, to make sure that we do four quadrant biopsies, every centimeter in non-dysplastic patients, sorry, in dysplastic patients, two centimeters in dysplastic. Uh, make sure that we don't biopsy esophagus, and again, biomarkers not recommended. Overall, for everybody as the take-home points, non-dysplastic Bar Barrett's epithelium, repeat in three to five years. You don't need to repeat if your initial endoscopy doesn't have dysplasia. Barrett's indefinite, repeat in three to six months on a PPI. If persistent, repeat in 12 months. Both Barrett's with low grade and Barrett's with high grade are viable candidates for ablation. You have to consider endoscopic ablation or Q 12 month EGD in low grade and in high grade go to definitive therapy. Thank you for your time.